the School of Information Management at Dalhousie University. Her work is centered in the areas of knowledge organization, metadata, and knowledge equity. A citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario, she engages in work and research related to Indigenous matters in libraries and the larger cultural heritage sector with a deep interest in increasing access and visibility for non-textual materials and marginalized knowledge stacy is a passionate advocate for change in information structures and metadata systems within the library profession and across the wider glam sector a master of information studies graduate of the university of toronto i school stacy has numerous years of experience as a professional librarian as an associate librarian at york university she has held positions as music cataloger digital humanities librarian and as a member of the department of student learning and academic success she focused on critical pedagogy with collection responsibilities for philosophy and history welcome stacy and with that i will turn the time over to you Thanks, Jen. I'm like, how long is that bio? So <laughs> it's great. Thank you very much uh, for that introduction. I'm really um, uh, delighted to be with you all today. So I will try and keep track of any questions in the chat, but also um, you can hang on to them to the end as well. Um, and yeah, I'm just also uh, really pleased to so many, see so many people in this uh, certificate program. Um, I don't think I said in my bio that I was the co-founder of the Scholar Communication Initiative at York University. So been uh, involved in open access, um, the open movement, open glam for, for many, many years. So um, really, again, really happy to, to see you all here. I'm going to try and share my slides uh, again. I did, I did successfully already, so it should be okay. All right, so um, just another welcome. Um, so part of when we talk, especially around indigenous um, issues or matters, um, it is particularly important, well, important all the time to consider where we are. Um, and so uh, just thinking about um, where you're located is really important and to know um, whose land you are occupying uh, is also really important to the history of that territory. Um, and I'm uh, currently, as you may see, in Halifax, Nova Scotia, which is actually in Mi'kma'ki, which is the territories of the Mi'kmaq people, the unceded territories of the Mi'kmaq people. So I'm very grateful to be a guest on, on these lands and acknowledge uh, their um, continuing presence um, here. And I really like this um, slide that uh, I got, I guess, gifted, received from <laughs> as part of a presentation from Ann Carr Wigan, who's a librarian at the University of Alberta. And um, I like this way of thinking about how also the land has shaped you. So we also want to think about our connections to the places and territories that we have lived and worked and um, met and think about how that actually has impacted you um, and your relationships. And also I want to acknowledge, although we're meeting virtually, that we are all connected through various cables and technologies that allow us to meet. And those cables um, are traveling through different Indigenous territories as well. And also because we're talking about anti-colonialism, it is also important to recognize that the technologies that we use all the time, every day, um, have been developed in ways that are oftentimes um, inequitable. So just thinking about, uh, about that um, hardware uh, that also is allowing us to meet. So I won't talk too much to this slide except to say um, this is definitely a overview <laughs> a bunch of different topics hopefully won't seem too overwhelming um some of this may be familiar to you already um and if it's not uh, i hope it will provide some good background and if you know some of these issues already hopefully there's um, some content here that you will be able to uh, grab onto and again because um, it's, it's, I feel especially important in this kind of work. Another kind of introduction to me is that, yes, I'm a citizen of the Métis Nation of Ontario. This comes um, uh, to me through my dad, um, whose uh, mother is that picture from the, the painting, my grandmother, 
who is from uh, Manitoba originally, but we have um, long roots uh, in uh, the Georgian Bay region, which is sort of on Lake Huron out into through the north, uh, historic Northwest. Also talking about territory. So I'm from Thunder Bay, Ontario, which is in north of Duluth. Um, so kind of pretty cold there, typically also cold in Winnipeg, which is also in the prairies. Uh, I'm glad I'm not in Winnipeg today, frankly. And then I've uh, also spent quite a bit of time in Oakville, Ontario. So all this talk about territory and land is actually setting us up to talk about um, issues around uh, decolonization or colonization more specifically, and then anti-colonialism uh, and what that means. And so if you have never um, read this particular uh, article called Decolonization is Not a Metaphor, I strongly encourage you to uh, check it out. It's not the easiest piece to read, but it has a lot of really thought provoking things to say when we talk about decolonization. And it's really important to consider the ways that uh, colonization in particular is really about removing indigenous people from land. And uh, whether that be through acts of assimilation, um, genocide, removal of culture, because then it makes that land sort of open for settlement, for uh, development in different kinds of ways. So it's that disappearance of indigenous peoples is really the whole function of colonialism. And when indigenous people are removed from land, it's not just about you don't live there anymore, but it is this disruption um, also to epistemologies, to, to uh, ways of being and um, understanding the world. And so to consider when we are in the positions that we are, oh, thank you, this is great. <laughs> I'm just noticing, thank you for those links. Um, but when we're in the positions that we are working in information or working in cultural organizations or working with um, you know, information materials and knowledge, it is particularly important to recognize the roles that colonization has played in, in um, removing indigenous peoples from those knowledge materials. We can also think about um, colonialism in the, in the, from the standpoint of, of removal of culture. So whether that's a removal of objects from people and we can think of sort of where a lot of materials in European museums come from um, and also removal of language. All, all of that really um, is profoundly uh, I was gonna say disruptive isn't even the strong enough word for that. And so when we're in these information positions, it's really important to think about that and think about how that has continued on, even though it might seem well that was in the past, it's it's not uh, really when we when we think about it. And so thinking about what that means in the context of uh, creative commons or open access or copyright to think of those conceptions of how we understand knowledge and ownership and that locating of that understanding of actually being a very sort of Western, uh, a very European, I mean, that's where the roots of, of our sort of our regimes of copyright come from and what that means for uh, Indigenous uh, knowledges. And so this quote from um, Maui Hudson, I think is particularly important for us to consider because we have such a strong, and I mean, I totally, you know, as I said, co-founded the scholarly communication initiative, strong advocate for a long time for open access. We have such a strong connection between equity and open, right? And so it is disruptive, I think, to our ways of thinking to think actually maybe that is not an appropriate way of connecting um, equity or to think about justice, it is not necessarily the case that when something is open or making something open is actually equitable. It can, it can be the opposite. And this is especially the case when we talk about Indigenous data, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous materials. Um, and I'll talk a little bit ab about things like the public domain, but really to consider what it means to really bring um, a thoughtfulness to our work. And again, this is also, I sometimes hear about, well, we do 
sort of anti-colonial work or decolonization when we have time, but we really can't do that anymore. It really has to be part of the everyday work that we do around um, working with materials. So anti-colonialism is this um, movement towards resistance to colonial or imperial power. And again, uh, I think sometimes these concepts are a little bit removed when we're in North America to think about this idea of imperial power. But again, when we work in galleries, libraries, archives, museums, there is a absolutely a very strong foundation built on the theft of materials built on um, destruction of culture. And so we cannot sort of separate the work we do from it, the roots in this, in this place. So uh, something again uh, to think about and challenge us when we talk about something like creative commons, when we talk about something like open licensing and to consider the, the impact over generations of that removal of um, not only of the objects, but the ability to have uh, control over those materials. So when a community loses um, something, and not only that, they no longer have the ability to control what happens to those materials. And so part of the work we need to do now is to think about how we return um, that, uh, that control and that um, ability to say how something should be used to the communities that those materials are from. And this is this, again, thinking about, I won't read the whole quote, but justice, uh, equality, but also that self-determination piece is really, really important. So obviously this work is very political, right? We don't, and really all our work is political. We can't separate um, that from our materials. Is, oh, is there a question? I just heard something. Okay. And Sophia Noble draws our attention to, um, oh, I think I might even have her book right here. I do, it's on my desk. So here it is. <laughs> Some impression, if you haven't read it, it's great. Um, so again, when we inherit privilege, it's this massive knowledge regime. And we talk about copyright as often being a copyright regime, right? And so again, I know I'm, I feel like I've stressed this a bunch of times, but our work is built on actually systems of oppression and structural inequities. And we, even when we think we're doing work that is very uh, much focused on equity, we really need to step back and say, actually, where does this fit? Can we do this better or differently? and to recognize that we're not sort of separate from that um, history and that ongoing um, uh, ways that um, different communities have been marginalized, but also excluded from um, being able to have a say in their materials. So now I'm gonna talk a, a number of definitions of different ways to consider indigenous knowledge, traditional knowledge, um, some of those uh, kinds of things to just to get a, a better handle on, I should probably keep track of my time. Okay. Um, and so this uh, definition I particularly like, so indigenous data or data information knowledge in any format that impact indigenous peoples, nations and communities at the collective individual levels data about the resource environments, data about the individuals and data about them as collective. So the current definition or the way working definition of indigenous data is very, very broad. Um, and I think it might surprise you to consider it also means, so if there is, um, so where I'm located, if there was some sort of survey work happening around soil samples, for example, well, this is, this is Mi'kmaq territory. And that means that any data that is results or comes out of any of that um, work really should have uh, the involvement of uh, the Mi'kmaq people. Um, and so when, again, we talk about Creative Commons licensing or open licensing, we need to think about, is this indigenous data? Very likely it might be. And then what does that uh, what kinds of protocols or things would we need to be putting in place to ensure that that's appropriately um, 
uh, cared for. Traditional knowledge, um, this is the official definition from, from WIPO. So living body of knowledge passed from generation to generation within a community, it often forms part of a people's cultural and spiritual identity. So when we talk about traditional knowledge uh, or TK and copyright, um, I would, <laughs> I could try and ask you this question. What, I mean, could we foresee any problems with copyright with this definition of traditional knowledge? I don't know if anybody wants to venture a guess or answer, you might know this already. Yeah, it's exactly, it isn't a fixed format. Traditional knowledge often held in the collective I don't know how uh, we can think about how our copyright regimes typically think of, yeah, not based on individuals, property or ownership, right? So it's not, if something is held in the collective and is passed down from gener generation to generation, what does that mean for public domain, right? Well, we have all, our whole system of, of intellectual property is really based on this idea of ownership and individual ownership. And so, uh, indigenous knowledge and traditional knowledge presents a particular and very serious uh, challenge to, um, to intellectual property regimes as they exist in most countries in the world. And so Canada, uh, for example, has, um, uh, so people might know the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples and um, well, they, it doesn't really work that way though, right? You can, yes, but part of it should, should not intellectual property law change to actually be able to encompass indigenous knowledge instead of indigenous knowledge having to fit into a system that is not generous or appropriate for indigenous knowledge. So I think that's the question. There are different workarounds and you will see indigenous communities have um, collectives or uh, cooperatives as techniques of, of this, but it shouldn't be, um, yeah, so thanks, Rob. Um, it shouldn't be that up to the community to try and sort out uh, developing incorporation for some of, some of these materials. Um, so again, the sort of thinking in a very um, wide ranging idea about what could be related to Indigenous peoples found in collections, so material culture, primary sources, so you just, just saw here recordings, data sets, digital objects, really almost uh, anything that sort of touches on um, Indigenous peoples, as you saw that in de uh, definition of, of Indigenous data, uh, the same kind of thing. Yes, exactly, Emma. So um, going to play this video, I think I have time for this, um, from OCAP. So OCAP stands for Ownership, Control, Acquisition, Possession. If it comes from a particular um, body in Canada that was that it works on First Nations governance, um, hopefully you'll be able to hear it. If you don't hear the volume, let me know but I'm gonna play this uh, now. First Nations people have always understood the value of community, the importance of respect, and the need to protect our resources for future generations. And today, one of our most important resources is information. First Nations people have always been information gatherers. When we track and hunt or gather food from the land, we're engaging in information gathering that has a direct and important impact on our lives. First Nations people understand that information isn't just about numbers and surveys. It's about culture, identity, traditions, and self-determination. <laughs> 
That's why the First Nation Information Governance Center was created. Since 1996, its mission has been to uphold the values of OCAP, a set of principles designed to protect First Nations ownership and jurisdiction over their information and ensure that First Nations people are the stewards of their own information. OCAP ensures that First Nations people have ownership both individually and collectively as a community. It puts them in control so that they can decide how it is used, by whom, and under what conditions. It ensures that they have the right to determine and define access regardless of where it is held. And it defines possession, ensuring that they have the power to use their information for the benefit of their own communities. Possession is key to making ownership, access, and control possible. Taking together the First Nations principles of OCAP embody one important idea, that First Nations people understand their own needs and are in the best position to govern their own information. The right of First Nations communities to own, control, access, and possess information about their peoples is fundamentally tied to self-determination and to the preservation and development of their culture. Okay, so OCAP is one um, set of principles um, definitely uh, known and used within Canada and specifically for First Nations communities. Um, but that video should give you a sense of the kinds of issues that are particularly important when we talk about uh, Indigenous knowledge, Indigenous data, Indigenous information, and in particular, um, that there is the need for First Nations people, Métis people, Inuit people in Canada, as well as all Indigenous people everywhere to have control access over our own materials. And this is, uh, again, um, a sort of a problem, uh, especially in government and um, uh, universities of researchers, for example, doing research um, on Indigenous people um, and having that uh, data and not uh, ensuring that there is appropriate control of uh, Indigenous people. So again, hopefully this can start to show you some of the problems with um, most copyright regimes. I have another video. Okay, maybe I'll play a couple minutes of this uh, video and, um, and then uh, go on. So just one sec. And so that creates from this, this core of spiritual law, an outer layer of natural law. And that natural law is what we observe from looking at our other brothers and sisters as, that are part of creation. From there, we've developed this whole wealth of law over time. And it's a law that governs interactions amongst humans um, and as well as other beings. And how do we manage all of those messy relationships? Building on all of that, and, and sometimes in response to a particular situation, we'll have um, what it is referred to as human law. And that's uh, sometimes also talked about in the context of temporal law. So it's a law that comes in um, a particular form at a moment in time, given a particular context, and that is supported by that core of spiritual law, that understanding that comes from the natural world, the law that we've developed over time, and then we have a human response to a particular context and an ability to make decisions based on our protocols and our understanding of all of these levels of law that are ebbing and flowing and interacting with each other so that we can have appropriate human responses and that we can communicate with each other about what those responsibilities and obligations are. That's the basic structure of Anishinaabe law. And when we think about water, um, as part of that, we have spiritual instructions relating to water. We see water's interaction in the natural environment and how other beings interact with water. And that means observing natural environment, seeing what's happening with the water itself, but other beings in creation, fish, frogs. I have the links for all these videos, so I encourage you to watch uh, the whole video later. But So this is an example of of Anishinaabe law um, and um, she's talking about nibi, so water. And 
what uh, I would like you to take from this particular video is the ways that, again, we sort of have taken our ideas about law or copyright law or understanding intellectual property, for example, as being kind of uh, standard or the way it is. And that's not actually the case. There are many other ways of understanding um, law or protocols for, for understanding um, how we relate to each other and even how we relate beyond human relationships. So how we think about how we uh, consider different parts of the world around us. So uh, again, a lot of Western concepts of ownership and intellectual property law really takes um, being able to own something and then I can use it. But if you don't have that concept of, of owning a piece of land or owning a particular object and then just being able to use it in the way that you like, then you have a fundamentally different relationship with the world that completely changes how we understand um, knowledge, what we can do with it, materials, all of those kinds of things. So again, it shouldn't be for Indigenous people to necessarily fit into um, existing copyright laws within uh, Canada or the United States or anywhere else, but how do we actually uh, rethink our intellectual property laws? And this is a really um, challenging problem. So Canada has, has taken under the so United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People, um, Bill C-15, saying that, and so that um, we are going to adopt UNDRIP. But again, it fundamentally challenges all sorts of areas that are the ways that the, you know, the state is constructed. And so what does that mean to actually try to uh, bring some of these, um, bring this framework into, I was going to say conversation, but it's not even the right word, but bring that into, into the ways the state governs. And I think it is very, very challenging. Um, and so moving from that to talk about something like public domain, um, we can begin to see some of the problems with, I won't show this video now, but obviously if we have a completely different sense or understanding of ownership and what knowledge is and how it is cared for and, and what it means, something like public domain doesn't work because public domain implies that a certain particular point in time, which is actually seems somewhat arbitrary, something is no longer yours to control necessarily. It is now the public. But if you have something that is a, a traditional knowledge, how can that all of a sudden not be your communities anymore at a particular arbitrary date? Or what does it mean when something was your communities and sacred and now a, a, you know at some point is just arbitrarily now is everybody's? So, um, and this has a, a, been a big challenge, I think, for many um, cultural organizations where you might engage in digitization projects. What if you're engaging in mass digitization projects and you have something in your collection or that is being digitized that is related to Indigenous people and now it's public domain and you're just uh, digitizing everything. And I think that is um, hugely challenging and, again, requires uh, us to sort of step back and consider how we can change the ways processes that we have in place to consider what that means. So this is just one of the articles from UNDRIP. So if you haven't checked UNDRIP out, I encourage you to have a look. Um, but if we adopt UNDRIP and say, okay, Indigenous people have the right to maintain, control, protect, and develop their cultural heritage, traditional laws, traditional, you know, this goes on. If this is the case, what does that mean when we have collections, data, and materials in our organizations that would potentially meet um, these requirements, right? How are we going to do um, that work? And what does that mean for the Creative Commons license? <laughs> so, so when we can't necessarily take the public domain as, as being potentially ethical or appropriate, Add to this, one of the challenges for Indigenous communities is often that uh, 
um, a lot of the uh, are oftentimes for Indigenous communities that there are sort of the records of uh, Indigenous presence or of one's ancestors or one family members are actually European records or records held by colonial institutions. And so you again have this uh, additional layer of challenge. And so, um, so for example, if there is a land claim um, case going on that a lot of that might actually built, be built on colonial records. So I know that for my own family, that some of the only traces that we have of presence is through um, government uh, documentation, because it's not like, <laughs> I was gonna say my family is very mobile for a long time. It's not like there's a lot of records that there might be in other kinds of ways. So thinking about that additional problem. So this is a, um, uh, one of my number of my ancestors are signatories on this petition. This becomes this very important petition in the context of proving presence, right? But this is in a um, government collection that was sort of mass digitized. And so what does it mean when you have a, an important document like this that's just part of a whole ream of, of things that have been um, scanned? And then we can talk about data sovereignty is extending um, on to this where uh, data sovereignty, so again, this idea of control um, over data, just being mindful of time and uh, what does that work? And so we do have uh, things that are developing like the traditional knowledge labels. I don't know if any of you have encountered these before or seen them before. They're sort of built, actually I saw, okay, so I see some hearts, so at least one person, so, oh good. So these are, um, I actually first saw a presentation, one of the first presentations I saw was actually at a, at a Creative Commons Summit. And so kind of built around the idea of the Creative Commons labels where you have kind of an intervention into um, copyright law and there are a set of labels that can be applied, for example, within a repository setting that give primarily their guidance on access to materials and also allow for some communication of usage. So this is just a screenshot of some of these labels. Um, so you can see something like seasonal is put on a particular item that might be available only at particular times of the year. So if you have a, a recording of a story and that story is only supposed to be told, um, for example, in the winter or when there's, when there's snow, then you would set requirements in your repository that this is open at this time and it's closed at this time. And then that seasonal label also gives additional um, information to users to be able to see something very visual. And so you can see these other, um, kinds of labels. And again, I encourage you to, oh good, so thank you, Jen, uh, to go and check them out. So information about protocols, and they also intervene. So it has those two roles, sort of again, like the Creative Commons labels. So they are giving information about how we understand how something is to be used, but also uh, have that role of being able to teach people who are encountering these materials something about the protocols um, that one should have to approach those materials. And so here's an example from Raven Space Publishing. Um, this is, um, oh my goodness, I'm just like, the multimodal digital exhibit software that begins with an S, which is left my head right at the moment, um, but uh, does allow for the integration of the, um, TK labels. And so even to be able to, to be able to look at this resource, you have to um, go through like a first sort of landing page, right? And then all throughout, there's different uses of these labels that sort of govern your experience. So this is one way of, again, intervening into that space of uh, copyright. Again, rather like the, the CC, uh, licenses do. And also we have Makurtu, which is a content management system, which you may or have heard of, but so repository software, but created with 
uh, right at the beginning with the intention of being able to hold Indigenous materials. So it has a whole set of protocols that are um, built around it that allow for um, different ways of navigating and negotiating materials. So um, there are uh, resources that are being developed. I'm um, on a working group for an IEEE um, standard that's being developed around the provenance of Indigenous people's data. So I think we will see more and more um, standards or protocols and um, hopefully techniques to be able to better um, handle um, and sort of respectfully um, manage materials related to Indigenous people or, or Indigenous people's data. Um, because uh, our intellectual property laws may or may not, um, you know, will take a while to kind of uh, catch up. Certainly I know in Canada that I don't foresee massive change um, coming very, very quickly on some of these topics. So what do you do in the interim? Even though law, you know, technically your intellectual property law says, yes, this is public domain, doesn't mean you as an organization should necessarily say, well, it's just public domain, so we don't have to do anything. That is not necessarily the re a responsible or ethical way of um, going about uh, managing materials. So how do we in the interim find different ways of uh, dealing with material? There's also GIDA, so the Global Indigenous Data Alliance, um, which is uh, developing the care principles Again, some of you here may have heard of the CARE principles. I always think it's like FAIR and CARE work together. So collective benefit authority to control responsibility and ethics. So off, to, off sort of like OCAP and providing a set of principles to be able to do our work. And again, I know very much that um, the open access community or thinking about we should make everything as open as possible. And then we have to sort of step back, but should we? And when is that appropriate? And what do we do um, if it's not? And how do we understand that? And I think, again, this is certainly um, has uh, a lot more tools now than even three years ago. So that is good news. And again, should be part of the way that we do uh, work or the way we handle uh, materials and collections. And this is something the Open Glam community is paying attention to. So if you've been part of the Open Glam Principles, um, I know that that's something that is being worked on as well and thinking about how do we say open, but you know, when is it, when, when does working appropriately and ethically mean that we have to uh, acknowledge that what works for one kind of material or one kind of community does not work for all. So again, recognizing um, challenges with um, public domain. And then there are also um, initiatives like indigenization, which is specifically looking at digitization projects and um, indigenous communities and putting indigenous communities or indigenous peoples um, bringing community in to do that work as well, because what is also particularly important is recognizing that it shouldn't be for Indigenous people. You don't do something for Indigenous people. It should be with or building capacity or capacity sharing so that work is done by Indigenous people themselves and that Indigenous people are involved in um, that uh, development either, you know, as, as in this example, data stewardship or uh, digitization, collection management, really being able to actually be um, doing that work uh, ourselves rather than uh, a university necessarily doing that work and say, oh, look, we digitized your, your collection. Um, And a last couple points, 
<laughs> just as I'm wrapping up, because again, I think part of the challenge, this is a, a really interesting piece by Sandy Grande, refusing the university to, to acknowledge that some of this is just not appropriate for certain organizations to do. And again, to really think about what does it mean for uh, universities that have certainly probably extended to museums, archives, other institutions that have been actively involved in colonization to necessarily, is it even possible to uh, decolonize? Um, what does that mean when we're talking about control of materials? And this point too, so maybe at some point decolonization actually means not a library doing something or um, thinking about does this material actually even belong here or do we need to give that back to community or ask the community what they would like? Um, because there has been, again, while it's in our collection, we have ownership of it, we should be able to do something with it. Um, and again, even though that may be technically true from the perspective of, of um, how we understand intellectual property law, that may not be um, appropriate or ethical at this point. And so finally, um, it is really important if you are in a position to be able to make decisions around materials or you have or in a in an organization that is is doing some of this work that you consider uh, the fact that you can uh, do something or advocate for change um, within intellectual property law, within the ways that we deal with indigenous materials. Um, because it is, again, something that's really important and not something that should be done um, in the sort of when we have time um, kind of category. And with that, I think we have some time for questions. Good, so I'll stop uh, sharing and see if there's any questions or comments, or maybe you have your own experiences you'd like to, to share. Um, and while we're waiting for this to come in, please feel free to share them in the chat or unmute yourself, whatever you'd prefer. Um, I do have a couple follow-up questions if no one else has questions right away. So maybe we could start with one of those. Um, so you were talking a lot about um, digitization and who makes those decisions and those sorts of things. So could you speak more perhaps about who decides what knowledge can be digitized and openly shared online in the context that you were already working on? Um, well, I guess <laughs> I was telling my kids, I'm like, it's the, it depends. Because always, they're always like, what about this? I'm like, it depends. Um, so it, you know, it, it, I spent 15, 16 years working at a university library and involved in many digital projects. And so I know that sometimes we would do things like, oh, um, the Internet Archive is we have some money to scan some collections. We'll just take everything from pre, you know, 1920 and send over these boxes of stuff. Right. And, and so it's whatever the decision making process is around a particular collection. Um, so the, the ways that, I, from my understanding, a digital collection might come, you might have a um, faculty member who has some material and they want to mobilize that in some way. You might have um, a scanning project based on a particular um, collection. So I know that I was doing some work on the Mariposa Folk Festival at York University and um, for a few years, the folk festival had a native people's area that was curated by Alanisa Bobswin, who's a well-known um, filmmaker, indigenous filmmaker in Canada. And there were a lot of photos in that collection, but nobody knew who was in the photos, right? So you have this, this problem of, of, so something's been digitized at some point because there was a going to be a digital exhibit, but you don't, we actually went through the archives trying to figure out like, do we even have contracts? How do we understand who's in those in those photos, right? So that's, it is a challenge sometimes. It's not always obvious who whose materials are there and how you understand 
um, even how to identify the individuals. And so it is maybe if we don't know, even though the organization that, that donated those photos, maybe even that this, they're fine with it, maybe we should, we should not post those if we don't, if we actually don't know whose they are. So um, it's some of those kinds of considerations. Um, I've also been quite active in the Wikimedia, Wikipedia Wikidata community. And I've had conversations with people around doing mass digitization projects and then uploading those images to Wikimedia Commons. And again, the challenge is when you do really mass bulk uploads and you haven't looked at the materials, you don't know what's in there. And so I've come across materials in the Wikimedia Commons um, repository that I think might be problematic, but there's not really a good uh, mechanism in that community for for either handling community, you know, in materials that might be colonial in nature or indigenous, and certainly not a good pathway for um, removing them or or understanding some of that that those needs. So I don't know. I don't know if I answered your question exactly, except to say it depends, right? And I think it's, you know, I know many organizations are are working on these issues and there is um, awareness in some places, but it is not always easy to develop the sort of protocols and practices um, needed to necessarily um, rethink maybe some of those, those issues around digitization. I'm just looking at the, the chat box. Um, oh. Go up to Laura, Lori's question. Sorry, that was me. <laughs> I put a huge <laughs> thing in there. Um, and I have a question about it, but uh, I'll wait till the other question's answered. Okay. So, um, students looking for Indigenous knowledge in the context of finding primary source materials online. Should librarians preface any kind of presentation with uh, a statement or discussion about the problems with TK? Yeah, I think so. I mean, I think it's, I think. You know, there are lots of challenges for, for teaching, I think, in this particular area when we talk about sort of ethical, if you're doing Indigenous research, there are ethical practices, and then again, increasingly put in place in Canada anyway by institutions about Indigenous research. And to understand um, what could and, and should be used in, in particular ways. So um, again, it's not always obvious when you look at something like Wikimedia Commons, if something is there that shouldn't be there. So for example, if, if it's a, a something from a ceremony that should be secret, um, but maybe it's about trying to guide students to appropriate resources at the beginning to say that these ones, these resources are, um, uh, appropriate or they have protocols in place and to understand that that idea of protocol and again if you're teaching students who are doing Indigenous research how do you also ensure that they sort of understand the context of Indigenous research. I'd say that those things kind of need to go together if you're looking at primary source materials you know having that um, understanding of sort of ethical approaches I'm looking at my desk what else do I have on my desk I don't have the book I was going to Maybe it's somewhere. I don't know. It's not on the floor. Um, but how how you approach indigenous research, I think, is important as well. Um, when I go to Susan's question about the six R's of indigenous. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I don't, I don't mean to uh, shift the conversation too yep. much away, but I've been really thinking about OER as pedagogy, right? And like, and and thinking. And so inspired by the concept of relationality, reciprocity, connecting to nature, right? Connecting to spirit, to connecting to the lived experience of a human being, right? Um, and that, that that can't necessarily be codified, right? Um, and do, should we even be codifying that? And then thinking about dissemination of information along that along those lines, kind of almost flies in the face <laughs> of of you know so much traditional ways uh, of of white privilege <laughs> ways of being 
Um, so yeah, like you said, we're flipping it on its head right now. And so there's ways I'm thinking about, I'm an instructional designer kind of designing assessments and designing educational uh, and curriculum through this new lens of indigenous traditional ways of knowing, right? And being in the world. Um, so I know that's kind of off the topic of, of OER as a, from a librarian standpoint too. Um, but I'm just curious if the six R's have been part of um, your work and um, how that's been operationalized. Sure. So no, I think it's I think that's an important point. So for those who don't know, it's actually that started off as the four R's um, for Indigenous education, um, and then we have the five R's, and sometimes now the six R's. And so, um, so using the, those concepts as a way of understanding or starting our work. And I think that's actually a really important point because it doesn't matter if we're doing instructional design or we're teaching or we're creating digital projects. If we think about how can we start from the beginning with this concept of, um, and, and I always think of the, the four R's or five R's, but these, these principles as being, you know, they would be important for any kind of way of working, right? That is appropriate. We want to think about relationships and responsibility, um, reverence, relevance, I think is also really important when we, when we talk about teaching and also the kinds of projects that we're working on reciprocity. So if we're, if we're building on practices and principles that are centered around these ideas, it really helps maybe shift our thinking from um, something kind of focused more on product as in we have something we own, we're going to digitize it and we're going to mount it up somewhere or we're going to do this, you know, it, it, it kind of changes our relationship. And actually I've just, I'm working on a, uh, a big indigenous terminology project where we are, because my area is knowledge organization, so I work a lot on terminology and vocabulary. And so uh, instead of trying to, for example, change the Library of Congress subject headings, creating a brand new platform for holding indigenous terminologies where we use the, the four slash five slash six R's as a, as a fundamental and UNDRIP as sort of, if we take those as fundamental sort of structuring ideas and frameworks, what does it mean to build that? So if we think about those as guiding our work, what does that mean when we talk about these things? And I think, again, it's important to recognize we can't sort of go back and pretend that it doesn't exist. And so how do we, how do we go forward? So I think that's a really great point and a really great um, way. It's not just OER and it's not just teaching. It really can encompass all the kinds of work that we do, um, I think. So that's a great question. Um, Elena. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, again, I think that's a really good question. So uh, the question around what do we do about, about mixing collections? And as I said, I've been involved in, in the Wikimedia projects for a long time, which has a, which I love and don't love some days. Um, and about how do we intermix different collections? And and again, from that data management standpoint, I think it's going to be important to bring along um, provenance information or or those traditional knowledge labels into um, when we mix different data sets or different repositories, what does that mean? And I think our technology is coming along to allow us to do it. Actually, all the, so the technology needs to come along, our protocols need to come along. And then the way we do our um, descriptions need to sort of come along with that because something that I didn't talk about here that can get really complicated is that, you know, different communities might kind of lay, might take a same piece of knowledge as being sort of shared, but contested potentially. So what does that, what does that mean when we have those kinds of, or territory? So territory, typically you might have many um, different uh, communities or nations living in sort of the same um, area. So how do we understand uh, those kinds of contexts as well? So it's not, um, you know, a straight line. And so I think our systems are going to, and our ways of working are going to have to be a lot more uh, generous in terms of being able to uh, do different things and then be a lot more 
um, open to to maybe mixing different kinds of uh, data together from that uh, data management perspective. I think we have time for one more question. If anyone has a burning question they'd like to ask. All right. Um, well, thank you so much, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Stacy. This has been amazing. We really appreciate your time and, and your expertise. Well, thank you, everyone. And I think we will wrap up. And thank you to everyone who's expressing their gratitude in the chat.